people are working on their MFA projects. And <laughs> now that we're archiving this, so they're going to check it later. I'm trying to read um, Donna's very elaborate <laughs> paragraph. It's really packed. It's like a condensed piece of information. I'll just read the title of Donna's talk is Myth, Information, Algorithmic Art, Visualization, and Virtual Collaboration. And it's actually a great honor to have Donna Cox here tonight. She's a full professor at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, she's held a joint appointment with, with NCSA since 1985. And actually, it's someone who is really responsible for bringing arts and sciences together as an artist and continues to do so in very proactive ways. One of the images that has always been in my mind as a kind of a seminal image is the visualization of the network connections in 1986. I remember seeing it uh, later, actually, in, uh, earlier in 1992. 92, I saw that C graph, and it just completely left me breathless. And I'm still looking at it as a, kind of a visualization of where we're going as a, a communication body of people. So Donna is going to talk about her work, and um, please help me welcome her. Hello, hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> Let's see, did I just turn it on mute? No, I'm on. You're on and on. On and on, on and on and on. Okay, well, let's see here. It is uh, 12 after six, and I'm gonna pack a lot of information into this very short period of time, and then I'll leave some time for questions um, but I'm going to talk about some early work. I'm going to actually compress about 15 years of work into about 45 minutes. So bear with me. I'm going to talk about early algorithmic art and some art that, is, uh, that I've been working on collaboratively for the last, since about 1985. Um, the premise that I'm going to talk about, though, this evening is the link between the evolution of consciousness in the artist that's reflected in the individual and also society. And I borrow these terms from Wilbur, who wrote Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality. And he talks about three stages of conscious development. And because I'm compressing a lot of my work over the last 15 years and more, I actually read this book and I thought, well, this is an interesting development of cognitive consciousness, but it kind of parallels where I have come as an artist. Now, the first stage is a stage of individualism, a feminist. I treated the computer as magical, as mythical, and I developed, I worked alone, developed my own code, and developed algorithmic art. The second stage, I worked collaboratively, in a very rational, symbolic, iconic way, developing information visualization with scientists uh, and other collaborators at the National Center for Supercomputing and focused on scientific visualization. And then in stage three, which parallels this development of Wilbur, of the consciousness and the individual and society, there is this much larger stage, and I think it's a stage that's reflected in all of society as a result of the internet. But it's a stage in which consciousness is much more universal, thinking of other, being networked, and globally connected, and thinking globally. But first I want to take a, just, a, just a brief history. Uh, originally, whenever I started work with, working with aesthetic forms, even prior to ever using the computer, I was very interested in mythologies, iconic representations across cultures, the issue of the female symbol in particular, issues that surrounded how different cultures dealt with creation mythologies. And 
I have been very curious over the years to relate this to the relationship between myth and advanced technologies. Well, in stage one, back when I was began, I mean, it was so long ago that I had to program the computer and build my own tools. I mean, literally in 1980, 82, there was no Photoshop. I started developing tools with a raster image maker. It was actually a prototype of the silicon graphics machine. It was called the Stanford Technology Tool or Stanford Technology Prototype. But I got into using the computer because you could send the computer lists of instructions that were repetitive, interactive, time sequenced. And I found the computer to be very interesting in terms of how I could program it algorithmically to make images such as this one you see here, Agony and Ecstasy, which is a self-portrait from 1981, um, in which I could actually develop a paint program as part of my uh, research at that time and use the paint program to image tools and time sequence images at that time. But the content of the images primarily dealt with women with uh, the transformation and metamorphosis of women in society, cross-cultural symbols of rebirthing, uh, gestalt images that would make you flip between uh, the face of something and a butterfly, uh, kind of taking in the idea of perception and gestalt and how that related cross-culturally to different iconic forms. So that interest I brought with me into the computer in a collaborative way when I started at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications as a joint appointment in about 1985. And whenever I got to the National Center for Supercomputing, I'd already been developing visualization tools. I had already had this kind of epiphany that I wanted to work with scientists that the tools that I was developing as an artist was really valuable to science and technology, and that artists had a contribution to make in that arena. And that due to C.P. Snow's two cultures and the separation of the arts and sciences had really left us sort of on the periphery of a lot of what was taking place in advanced technologies. So I wanted to work with scientists. I could see that the color algorithms that I was developing was important. And so when I got to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, I mean, I was a little visiting assistant professor in the School of Art and Design. And I, I was really, it was an unusual time. I mean, I was pretty much outcast because I was using a computer anyway. But to go hang out with the scientists, I mean, that was really sacrilegious. Uh, but I felt that it was, a, it was such a fertile time, and I was in the right place at the right time. And there at the National Center for Supercomputing, I could work with great scientists like Michael Norman and take my color algorithms and work with him collaboratively to use them as color transfer functions into images that we collaborated together. This is an astrophysical jet in which my color algorithms and his two-dimensional images from the supercomputer we created images together. And again, from these very unusual simulations that were coming out of cosmology, of uh, entomology, of plastic injection molding, I would see, I would perceive, I would interpret these images, uh, some of them being very primitive forms, some of them being phallic, some of them being basically images of female forms that I think arise in some ways from how we as a culture and as individuals deal with imaging. So pictographs as information technology, again, taking the ideas that icons and symbols as forms in our culture also allow us in a computer graphics sense with the massive amounts of data coming out of a supercomputer that I could reapply these ideas to the representation of information. So on the left, you see a, a sample image. And I, I just don't have time to go into some of these early images here. But this was a, a collaboration with Kodak on the representation of nine dimensions of plastic injection molding. And so the ideas of using glyphs or these pictographs in computer graphics, in 3D computer graphics, using 
two color maps to show scalar values using and applying my skills as a visually literate person, as a designer, as an artist, and applying those to the idea of data representation, we started developing new techniques and, and glyphs and ideas at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications for information design. And on the right is an image that I didn't work on, but two of my former students did work on. And at the time, it was a very seminal time in 1989 of how to take information and represent it in innovative ways that had been in the domain of artists and designers, but now we were reapplying these uh, ideas on color, form, geometry to representing data from a supercomputer. So the mapping of information and scientific visualization seemed to be a very rational, we were searching the truth in the data, it was a very important seminal time. And my colleague Bob Patterson and I, Bob, why don't you raise your hand, because he's sitting in the audience, and I as artists saw it coming in terms of the internet. I mean, we were sitting there in a setting of where there was mosaic uh, was being developed. I had been asked by the Bush administration to do the cover design for the HPCC. They had no data on networks. And so it was just like we were at the right place at the time, right time. Here we'd been representing all this simulation data from science, but we did not have anything to show what the internet was, what the backbone was, the client networks. So Bob and I as artists began taking on this project that nobody else would handle because it took so much hand editing. It was like taking data and hand editing data. No, you know, respectable computer scientist was going to do that. So we did it and came up with this iconic representation of the internet at that time. And it was the first, and it still gets two hits and two requests a week for this image. And that was developed, oh, we were started doing the data in 1990, and it's still lots and lots of, uh, we've updated it, but now the internet is just so complex. This kind of a representation, oops, sorry, this kind of a representation would not even, I mean, it's really very fractal-like if you tried to trace the growth of the internet today. It did grow exponentially. So to finalize uh, what it was like in stage two, there was this collaborative reaching out to others, working like with Bob Patterson, with Mike Norman, with other kinds of, sci with scientists at the supercomputing center. But it was also a time of taking these icons and relating them to what, again, the female in metamorphosis. I just could see that the work was there, that somehow even at this national center for iconic generation, that we had, in fact, we were creating what some people thought were even kind of pornographic images, and they were scientific forms. It's what people would see into the gestalt of the image. And in particular, this image on the right, which was a, a collaboration between George Francis and Ray Adasik. George Francis is a professor of mathematics at Illinois. We came up with this mathematical topological surface, but it took on this characteristic hourglass shape of a female form, an iconic form that was even represented in National Geographic. It was one of the first computer graphics images here from National Geographic in which this synthetic virtual object had a life of its own, a character of its own, and we took these forms artistically and created metaphorical collaborative poetry using computer animation. And I would like to show Venus and Milo just as an example of how we co-opted scientific visualization into a kind of postmodern narrative in an art museum using 3D computer graphics and collaborating with students and with colleagues at the National Center for Supercomputing. And you will see a metamorphosis of this Venus form in the narrative called Venus and Milo. And Milo is a, um, a semi-transparent uh, janitor in an art museum.
So all of these students have gone on to work in the, in the computer graphics industry and um, this collaboration, which is actually a four minute narrative, has won all sorts of international awards. But it was an interesting mix. Uh, you can go back to the ThinkPad now. The, the idea that I wrote about by 1980, 86 in Leonardo, the idea of, of Renaissance teams where you would have these collaborative units of people, artists, scientists, technologists, collaborating together and creating works and solving problems in visualization is interesting in that you can have a balance that's more toward the scientific aspect, or you can have a balance that's more toward, that leans in the direction of artistic output. But the idea that sometimes the collaborative function in itself, the unit, the team itself, becomes a kind of organism. And he called it Renaissance teams because in the Renaissance, there was a lot of collaboration between artists and scientists. And that was stage two. I mean, it was a very interesting time. I look back on these kinds of productions and working with scientists in the early years at, at the National uh, Center and, and University of Illinois, and it, it has been a very interesting, uh, wild roller coaster ride in which we have done some fantastic projects. And I felt like then, about 1992, there was a, a, a tremendous switch between the internet and the virtual reality had sort of come of age, and that, that led 
to the stage three, which I feel like I'm still in stage three, but about ready to get out of stage three. But anyway, we'll talk about that at the end. But anyway, remote virtual collaboration, even in Wilbur's book, I mean, just talking about as the child grows up, the child starts to consider other in a much more global sense. As a society grows up, it starts to consider the global in a big way and gets out of its sort of, uh, uh, and in fact, one might say that the entire earth is growing up now as a result of our collective consciousness and the internet and what's taking place. So for this period of time, I, I took a sabbatical and worked harder than I've ever worked in my life. Um, on this movie, Cosmic Voyage, which was funded by the Smithsonian uh, and the Motorola, and for the Cosmic Voyage, it was an IMAX movie uh, in which we uh, uh, created, I was associate producer and art, uh, for scientific visualization and art director for the Pixar and CSA segment. And it was a large global renaissance team of artists and technologists and scientists. And we took, instead of doing special effects for this movie, we told the story of the relative scale of things in the universe by using simulations that scientists were making for science and using that as dynamic data to drive what we, would going, we were going to see on the screen. These are colliding galaxies in uh, the universe. The data was simulated by Lars Hernquist and Chris Mijos at University of California at Santa Cruz. And the um, uh, uh, and then we collaborated with Bob Patterson, Eric Wesselak, Marcus Tiebo uh, from the National Center for Supercomputing, Mike Norman, and then uh, at, um, and we had this scientific advisory team and every scene from this movie had to be approved. And we did a phenomenal thing of taking many, many hundreds of gigabytes of data and turning them into images. And we have a lot of artistic control with these images because all you, the really, all the data starts out as being are little X, Y, Z points of the gas and the stars. But to add the choreography and the color, all of these are aesthetic decisions. And the goal was to communicate to a much larger audience the big picture of the universe. And you could take the same data and with different, for example, here's different color treatments of the same data. There was a tremendous amount of collaborative artistic and design input from the artist. It wasn't just the scientific data. During that period of time, we started to use virtual reality as an interface to create the animations for the film. Uh, myself, uh, Robert Patterson, Marcus Tiebo, developed the virtual director, which we see as a kind of workbench. And here is a, a, a shows a little bit about the, the virtual cave is director. an interactive virtual theater with surround sound and stereo projection that allows plan. total immersion in the 3D computer graphics. A variety of interactive visualizations have been developed such as a representation of the formation of galaxies in the early universe. Using the cave, we have visualized over three minutes. So this is just showing you what some of the other simulations were for Cosmic Voyage. And here are the colliding galaxies. Well, uh, we developed this tool, and Bob Patterson, you see here, is using the virtual director to control the camera and do the choreographies for scenes. And because the cave is a collaborative environment, um, uh, we had scientists in there creating paths through the data and uh, looking at these paths. And, and then the output would go to Pixar Animation Studios developed special software that we use to visualize with. And this is us standing inside of the cave. So I'm going to go back to this, and if we could have the next step video now. And this is a good, the Discovery Channel came to NCSA and wanted to film us and did a little thing on the virtual director and the making of Cosmic Voyage. It's a nice little 
package, I like to show it, and it shows the Beckman Institute. It, you know, the media always sort of gets it right. So there's some, kind of some. Yes, they we're going to see what was shown on the Discovery Channel. This was uh, just a few years ago. I've almost got us up to present day, and it's 25 till. <laughs> Dangerous place. Coming up, directing a film from inside the computer. Virtual directors have come to Hollywood. <laughs> I know it's such a trip. <laughs> and we here we are Traditionally, <laughs> movie directors have worked very closely with a cinematographer to determine exactly what a scene should look like or what the camera's point of view will be. But a team at the University of Illinois National Center for Supercomputing Applications has developed a process where film directors can step into their own films and decide exactly what a camera's view should be. Whether it's a high-speed chase or just floating through space. Donna Cox and Bob Patterson were trained as visual artists. Donna as a photographer, Bob as a filmmaker. But now they're focusing on the virtual director, a visualization process that takes massive computer data from scientists and turns that data into pictures that people can understand and use. How do we look into these artificial worlds that we create with a computer? You have to control the viewpoint. That viewpoint has come to be known as the computer graphics camera. When I first started working in computer graphics, one of, the, one of the things that most interested me was the fact that physical restrictions were lifted. You could hang a camera or a light without the use of a stand. You could just place it in space. The virtual director utilizes a computer-controlled rear-projected room called the cave that creates a virtual environment for the film director. You wear um, stereo goggles and it tracks your head position so it knows where you are and it's always drawing the stereo images for the person with the head tracker. So you can move your head and actually look around objects, really enhancing that three-dimensional aspect. It is as if you step inside of the computer and so whatever computer graphics environment that you have defined, whether it's colliding galaxies or an art deco room, you actually step inside this room and you see projected on the walls these artificial world that you have created. In the virtual director, we are controlling the computer graphics camera with a handheld wand. When we move this wand in our real space, we are actually controlling the motion of the camera through this artificial world. We are creating a path that will allow us to see the virtual camera output and feed that into other software to create an animation. Navigate, fly. Donna and Bob, with programming help from Marcus Tiabo, built voice commands into the virtual director to produce a healthier, more creative tool. I took a one-year leave of absence to go work in the special effects industry. And uh, late during that year, from mousing and banking and typing long hours every day, I developed uh, tendonitis, which is a form of repetitive strain injury. And it really was debilitating. That's when I started getting into researching voice recognition technology. Stand by. Roll camera. I think it allows the person to have a lot more creativity and to interact in a way that's more natural. It becomes a much more intimate interaction with all the idiosyncrasies and in some cases all the brilliances of interacting with another person. So we'll go down to sea level and cruise around the net a little bit here. The voice recognition Play. interprets Donna yeah, or Bob's voice, Play. sending keystroke commands into the virtual director. Then it Play. applies those commands yeah, to the okay. camera. The visualization of Cosmic Voyage, an IMAX film to be shown on 70-foot high screens, has been the team's most challenging project. In the film, gases become galaxies, galaxies condense, and galaxies collide as the audience travels through time and space. We took over 100 gigabytes of data and turned it into about 100 gigabytes of images. And uh, by just moving the wand around in three-dimensional space, I'm controlling six parameters of camera control, position and rotation. And then I can save a good position, 
and I can very quickly and easily create these camera moves. The thing about the virtual director that's wonderful, if you want to put the camera on the other side of the galaxy, you just reach over there and put it there. I think there's a similarity between what artists and scientists are trying to do. I think our goal is making the invisible visible. And the computer has acted as a kind of a collaborative assistant to making that possible. By the way, if you're concerned about when our Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with the neighboring Andromeda galaxy, scientists uh, presume that it'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of about three billion years from now. Done. <laughs> and we've got time to worry about that, don't we? So just take that off and we can go back to this. So I just want to reiterate that we came up with this idea. I mean, teaching computer animation to students is really difficult when you've got a mouse and you're trying to tell, okay, now, you know, take the camera off in this way in this totally flat space of a computer screen. But if you're standing inside the cave, you can gesture and navigate the path and talk to the computer. And, and Bob is a real, I mean, he's, he was trained as a filmmaker, so the control of the camera is extremely important for him. And then having this whole room... You know, I mean, then I can get in there and argue with him about the way it's done. So, uh, no, we have a good time. But um, it's a collaborative environment. It's a space that's just not sitting at one place, but even the scientists. And, and uh, what we started doing with the virtual director then is the remote virtual collaboration. Now, what you're seeing over here is Glenn Wheelis, who's an environmental hydrologist. Uh, he's sitting in another state in Virginia at an immersive desk running the virtual director. I'm in the infinity wall. Bob is in the cave. And Stuart Levy, who is now the software lead on the virtual director, is sitting at a workstation. And we are all remotely collaborating. Now, again, coming back to this idea of iconic forms, cross-cultural symbols, it's very interesting to me, the whole issue of we, we have representations of data of galaxies colliding in the universe. We have representations. We have iconic forms that represent ourselves as avatars in virtual reality space. So just the studying, the whole idea about avatars, interactions, behaviors, how we relate to these avatars and these forms, I think is just a very interesting research topic that artists, I think, I think it's just very fertile ground. And Again, it relates to mythologies. I mean, even the term avatar comes from Eastern philosophy in terms of the incarnation of God as man, and we use it in computer graphics, the incarnation of the human inside the computer. So I just, the relationships there are just interesting to me. Now, um, then the idea that we could link together human beings in these virtual environments over distances over the United States, wherever you see a little pair of stereo glasses is a virtual reality site, and in the Alliance, we can link these virtual reality sites together. So here's a four-way collaboration between Glenn Willis, Stuart Levy, Bob Patterson, and myself, and we are all have our independent points of view, but, and we can control the navigation and those independent points of view, but the um, the avatars represent other people in this virtual space online. So. See? Yep. Hi, yeah. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Alliance researchers have created a virtual reality application called CVD that enables real time data exploration using the cave, immersive desk, or power wall. One of the components of CVD is Virtual Director a software framework that allows a user to interactively construct, record, and preview scientific visualizations using voice and gesture input. The other component of CVD is K5D, a configurable application that lets scientists visualize and interact with multidimensional numerical data from atmospheric, oceanographic, and other similar domains. That's nice. I can see you laying down keyframes. Is it looking pretty good? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Net broadcast, node one, play. How about we look at the hurricane data now? So here you can just see the hurricane traveling uh, inland and dissipating. 
What parameters do you have on, Glenn? Don, I've got everything on except for two and five. And this ability to collaboratively view and annotate virtual environments gives us the ability to archive these virtual experiences for later use. See you later, Glenn. Stop. Bye, Bob. Bye-bye, Glenn. We'll see you later. So we are interacting, sharing camera paths and data online and some people at a workstation, some people in a virtual reality setting. And here is a close-up. Here you can see there's a virtual television camera that is up, or I'm sorry, a virtual television that's in the upper right. This is a representation of Bob, who's <coughs> controlling the camera path. Here's Stuart, who went down into the Chesapeake Bay. And as you know, and the, and the favorite icon that people like to choose is the smiley face. And, and this whole viewpoint is from my point of view in the cave. This is my hand, and we're interacting. But we each have independent points of view. We can share, make a path, send somebody to our path, or they can just fly there, and they can see in real time what uh, is happening in the data. In this case, with the collaboration with Glenn Willis, we took their software, put it inside a virtual director, and his software visualizes the Chesapeake Bay and environmental hydrology data. However, the virtual director can handle a lot of different types of visualization software. And again, what's interesting is how people want to represent themselves iconically in these virtual spaces. You know, we have people who want to be television sets. We have people who want to be video cameras. Now, and Glenn Wheelis, who was sitting in front of the Immersa desk, actually was sitting in a wheelchair. He used to be a fighter pilot. And he chose to be a Star Wars uh, pilot's head for his imaging. And he uses virtual reality now to fly again, as he says. But we have become cybernauts in this space, hooking together uh, caves, desktops, supercomputers, and over the internet, interacting from desktop to desktop. But it's still rather expensive, so another experiment that the Alliance has is with this relatively cheap setup coming out of Argonne National Laboratories, where you can take $40,000 and you hook together this really cheap off-the-shelf video equipment, could it be in a space just like this? But you can link together with software online and get windows in from all over the world. So if, with your video teleconferencing like tonight, you can see the audience. You want to establish a sense of presence in these environments. Plus, just being able to, I did a talk in Boston, whoops, that was Boston, uh, just last Boston, um, last 1999 Boston, because 10 years earlier at SIGGRAPH, exactly 10 years earlier, 1989, we did a $250,000 demonstration with donations from AT&T on how this technology would someday be. We predicted 10 years ago in a demonstration at SIGGRAPH in 1989, and here I was asked to do a talk for the Chautauqua for, again, in Boston, and I played a lot of the old tapes from that particular SIGGRAPH, and it was very interesting, sort of the reiteration. But this is a performance space, so you can even use latency as a way to create designs. I mean, it's a, if you think about it, you've got this iterative function where you've got audiences coming in. I mean, look at this guy on the upper left. He could not be more bored. I mean, look, I love the, I mean, I love, look at this guy in the middle here. I mean, to think that these people have cameras, I mean, it's kind of this like vicarious experience. This is actually a tape from SIGGRAPH with Larry Smarr, myself, Bob Haber, with this elaborate setup, and nothing worked until the actual time we started running the demo, and it was at the Science Center for the reception in 1989. It was the most bizarre thing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. We didn't have the internet. Yeah, this was all satellite dish being bounced off. They, it was like... <laughs> It was incredible that we went through that to demonstrate the look and feel of what the internet would be someday, and how you could do teleconferencing. And there was no teleconferencing capability. So 
let me skip on here. So finally, we're up to present day, and it's 10 until 7. And um, so, the Hayden Planetarium, so the Cosmic Voyage was this wonderful collaboration, global collaboration. But I had to fly 192,000 miles in two years to pull these people together on some of these scenes. Now we're using the virtual director, the remote collaborative capability, to do a similar kind of project at the Hayden, new, just newly built Hayden Planetarium Dome in New York City. Here's the cutaway. It's right next to Central Park, and it's attached to the American Museum of Natural History. It's this big futuristic ball in a glass cage. I'm sure you'll see it in the next Godzilla movie rolling down the street. Uh, this is an artist's rendition before it was built. And this is Manhattan in the background. Does it look exactly like that? Yes, it does. And if you like, we have brochures. Um, yes, it looks like that. It's beautiful. They don't have the grass in, and the trees are not, and the pool isn't there. This part is still under construction. But all of this part opened for the donors in January on New Year's Eve, and then opened to the public and February 21st, and it's grossing this opener that we worked on, uh, is grossing about a million a month for people paying $10 a ticket. So inside the virtual director, this is what it looks like, sort of in the raw. There we have a tour out of our home galaxy through these galaxies. This is how it looks like when it's in fast, real-time choreography of this data. And in in fact, it's Brent Tully's data of the distribution of real galaxies. This is observed data. This is not simulation data, but observed galaxies in the universe. And Brent Tully has mapped, in fact, all the density of galaxies in the observable universe. And we've been working with him now for a couple of years on this project. Well, what's interesting to me is that in primitive cultures, such as the Mayan culture, they too had been studying the Milky Way. And in fact, if you really go back to primitive cultures, they had a lot of information. I mean, they were very wonderful astronomers. Now, their naming of things was a little different. You know, you had the turtle of rebirth and the copulating peccaries. And, but I mean, really, they, their <laughs> constellations were a little strange. But you have this, see this maize tree, this Seba tree. And the tree, as an iconic form across all cultures, is, is a very interesting. It's everywhere. So I'm going to come back to how, in these cultures, how these forms relate to our current advances in cosmology. But this is the um, it's excerpt from what we did for the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, in the Passport to the Universe section, which is a visualization of the distribution of, of observable galaxies, and then there is a transition to a simulation of the very large scale structure. And this is showing its SIGGRAPH. But of course, it's showing, I mean, we computed it. Big screen, so this is a tiny little subset. Now this, this galaxy was computed by the people at Hayden. This is our Milky Way. We take over from the background, which is the distribution of Brent Tully's data. And the choreography here is done as a collaboration. Bob Patterson did the choreography, and it's a collaboration with the Hayden. But the background is where we take over. This is the, from the real time, um, rendered real time from the uh, Digital Galaxy Project. Now note that our, our whole solar system is tiny, 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 tiny in our home galaxy, the Milky Way. There's the Magellanic Clouds down here. And we're going to take you on a tour out to the Virgo Cluster. 
So we're leaving our home galaxy, and everything that you see here is what we've been doing at NCSA with these scientists, one scientist in Hawaii, and one scientist, Jerry Ostriker, at Princeton. Could you kill that light because it's killing this image? Who could get rid of this light? Thank you. So these are, what you can't get at this resolution is that there's so much detail in these galaxies. Here comes Andromeda, our sister galaxy. You see, it's a long ways to Andromeda. The universe is a very big place. And see how there's this sort of filament? Now that's an observed filament. And it used to be that scientists predicted that galaxies formed on filaments. Now what's happening here is this tr slow transition to the simulated data of galaxies that have formed on filaments. Now the dome holds 440 people and there's seven footprints at 1280 by 1024 pixels per footprint. So that's a lot of resolution, and we're getting only a very small percentage of that on the screen. So it's sort of it's just a taste of the resolution. And in fact, this is basically one footprint out of seven, and it's only a small, small portion of the one footprint. And this simulation is Jerry Ostriker and uh, Paul Bodie from um, Princeton. So that is part of what is shown at the Hayden opening. But what's very interesting to me is this whole large scale structure of the universe. Here's another version of the, with different colors, different choreography. These are super clusters of galaxies. Our galaxy is huge. There's billions of stars. Our solar system is one star. And here are clusters of galaxies. I mean, just fathom. I mean, Cosmic Voyage was about relating the scale of the universe to human beings. The universe is just very big, but it's also very, very small. In fact, it's infinite in all directions. And in fact, some scientists say that internally, if you would go down, that you hold universes in your body. Every cell every that you have takes you to another universe and another solar system within. And in fact, that what you saw was a very small part of the simulation. What we have here is this incredible organic network of the simulation of the distribution of galaxies in the universe. Now that is amazing when you think about it. But what is very interesting is that these simulations show galaxies as being branching, filamentary, hierarchical, as many forms in nature that we find today, from trees, to Chesapeake Bay, to other forms, even the branching of the way cities grow. And another interesting thing is that the simulation, oops, the simulation itself is hierarchical, much like a tree with cells. This is a visualization of the simulation that created this, which is actually just a 16 million particle slice of a 1 billion particle simulation, which is incomplete. The point here is that the universe is very branching, tree-like, organic, filamentary, and that as we have had cross-culturally, in, in almost all religions even, and in art, 
so much tree forms, sacred trees of knowledge, trees of uh, the saber tree in this case from the Mayans. And in fact, we went down to Mexico and studied the Mayan culture and the idea of the saber tree and how it related to their culture is very interesting. And in many ways, it's very profound because when you think that for the last 2,000, 3,000 years, we've been creating images that relate conceptually and visually in form to our current most advanced theories of creation and cosmology. So I find it as an artist very interesting to look at culture and the mythologies in culture. And I believe that our current cosmological simulations that use supercomputers, that the eyes that we use as telescopes to look about, are in fact, we are inventing mythologies to tell the story. And that artists are important to be involved in this kind of imaging and storytelling. I think we bring to the table some very interesting ideas when we, I mean, I stood in many a meeting as the only artist and maybe one of two women at the Smithsonian uh, uh, Advisory Committee for the Cosmic Voyage. What we bring to the table, I mean, they argued for hours about the Big Bang. That's not as interesting as that there seems to be almost a collective consciousness of imaging that kind of comes up, whether it's in art, whether it's in craft, whether it's in cosmology, whether it's in astronomy, and I can show you some organic images from biology, that these forms reiterate and they represent sort of structures that are basic to our very uh, universe. So I find that it's just a simply an interesting relationship between creation myths and contemporary cosmology which is yet another kind of creation myth. And that that relationship is at many levels, not only in the hierarchical structure of the algorithms themselves, but all the way out to the very forms and the imaging and the tree branching structures that we see all through uh, nature. And the other thing that's very interesting is that this information about these, this relationship of myth to science does not make uh, it, it, I, I think myths are important. I think ritual is important to our culture. And that there's something there, and that the information about this relationship tells us something about artists, scientists, and consciousness in general. And that's what I think I'm going to be investigating even more in the future in stage four. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, God. We have some time for questions, actually. If anybody is curious, I know. Sorry, I went over just. Well, I, I actually have a couple of questions. The first one, dealing with your fourth stage, you, you're just starting to think about doing a PhD program with Kaya. And I'm curious, watching this, how. Uh, Two questions, why at this stage would you be interested as a tenured full professor to start a PhD study? And two, how you would start thinking and trying to bring these two the ancient myths along with the scientific visualization. And it seems to me that a lot of what you're trying to address is dealing with feminism and embodiment, almost in a kind of a 60s sense of um, the feminine feminism, going back to the mother earth, etc. And you're dealing with this science hierarchy, the NCSA. Are you planning to address it also from the hierarchy of how this visualization comes together and uh, the institutionalization of these visualizations and how they may impact the actual iconic imagery that you're pointing to? 
So that's a lot of questions, but you can start with the... <laughs> <laughs> so, Let me go to the hard sorry. one first. Uh, yeah, why would I why, possibly why, do exactly. I, I kept asking myself that, by the way. So. <laughs> I think that when it comes to our, this whole revolution, that I, it's either been a curse or a blessing to be, have been involved in as an artist. I mean, sometimes I, I get so frustrated, I just want to throw the, the computer across the floor and I say, why in the heck am I doing this? I mean, I'm semi-dyslexic, I don't belong in this whole area. You know, I can't type, you know, I, I get tired of dealing with numbers. Um, but somehow there is very complex conceptual stuff going on here. I need the time to really research and read the books and pull it all together. I've had a very unique special place and just this little special place at NCSA. No power. I mean, in fact, I was recently told that one of my major contributions is that I kept NCSA from being like a geeky place. I mean, what kind of a compliment is that? So, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, of course, uh, but there have been artists there that have contributed, like Bob and Colleen Bushel. There's been a lot of artists that have participated in the place. But I think that there are things to, to write about and to study and to make connections that have to be done in a, through writing and a lot of research. I think that we have failed in our university system by, by separating the technologists and the humanists. We don't have enough of this humanities and the arts looking at one another and making relationships because we are all culturally mediated. And I think that there's something else evolving here. There's something else that I want to check out, and I've been inspired by the Kyostar program in terms of just the study of consciousness. I, pra I, I have practically, with a few more credits, a degree in psychology, which really makes me dangerous. But um, I just find these relationships and the images that just come out from the scientists as well as artists and how that relates to our culture at that particular time. But there are images that relate that are timeless. And our conscious, I have this personal myth myself. If time and space is infinite in all directions, I think consciousness is infinite in all directions. And it's worth tying that to the kind of work that we do. So that's why I would, would embark upon a PhD at this stage in my career. Uh, I don't have to do that, but I think the other practical reason for that is I think that's the direction where university departments are going. This is much more practical now, a reason. Not only do I want the time to research, but I do believe that university apartments, one of the reasons that, that the fine arts area is not given enough respect, money, and the whole lot within university systems is because of the kind of political structures that have evolved and the lack of respect for the kind of um, scholarship that artists can and have done, and the in inventorship that is there also. So I think that a PhD and a PhD programs for artists in this country, I mean, you find it kind of weird. I would have to go to University of, you know, of Wales College to do this in a whole other country. Why don't we have it here? I mean, it was Larry Smarr who realized he had to go to Germany as an academic to get access to supercomputers and eventually brought that, I mean, just got tired of doing that and said, we need our own supercomputers in a university here in the United States. Well, I feel the same way about PhD programs. It's an option. Not every artist should do a PhD and not every artist should have to write papers, but I'm really convinced that there is a place and a structure for that and it will help artists in a university academic setting. What was the other question? Actually, you mentioned it a little bit. You, you said that you have no power within the whole NCSA. And I was, I, I was curious. Bob is saying it's not true. It's all perceived. I have no power. <laughs> it's perceived power. See, they, they interpret So that. why do you think it's not true? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not true. Uh, well, she's been an associate director at NCSA, and... Uh, 
you know. Until I got sick of that. Larry Smarr has always has valued our opinions as artists and has integrated us into the program. And, and, and NSF doesn't normally fund artists, but if we work with scientists and go in on proposals together, we, uh, we were able to get funding. And, and now NSF actually has programs for funding visualization directly, and they didn't used to have that. And so as artists in this environment, we've started to have an impact and the funding streams have changed, and, uh, and but there it, it is helps a, if you can bring there is a definite hierarchy power. of power, and and within within a center that's funded thir you know millions of dollars a year, when it comes down to whether it, and it's funded for science and engineering, you don't just go do a pure art piece in that environment. Um, in terms of, I think that it's also important, and I have been involved many a time in relating to um, visualization and there's ways of not being true with the data and there's issues to explore and I want to write about in terms of science lies and videotapes. And I think that that's a, <laughs> a great form. So um, I think that uh, given Given the situation, I think that um, uh, there it has, uh, after 15 years of being there, there has been a place that I have a unique place at the center. But as a whole, they will, uh, other artists many times who have tried to sort of penetrate that wall have discovered that because the, the um, for pure art, because of the, the mission is for science and engineering. It has been very difficult to do just pure art. But again, I was just one of those people that was in the glove that fit the hand. So I was interested in doing art and science. So I've, I've had an easier time, I think. Well, thank you. Thank you.